Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, thanks to Eileen and Tina and everybody here for this opportunity. Thanks to the KESS panel uh, in particular. So the opening slide is very relevant to what I want to say. And uh, when I end up with a similar slide, uh, again, it has a significance because this seems to me, KESS, and the way in which the three universities are portrayed there, seems to me to be a, a paradigm of parity of esteem, uh, particularly coming from uh, the Open University now, but having worked at Queen's, as you heard. Uh, and I've also been the head of an institution, or two institutions in England, uh, one of which was uh, rather like the University of Ulster, Leeds Metropolitan University, uh, and one of which is like the two members who are going to join KESS next year, uh, St. Mary's and Strand Millis. In my case, it's Liverpool Hope University College. And there was a battle in higher education for parity of esteem. And whether or not it's been won, uh, we, we can perhaps argue about. But the, the roots of this phrase, parity of esteem, on uh, either side of the Irish Sea, stem from an earlier debate in education. Uh, in that case, about secondary education. So it isn't just a formality to, to show that Kess itself is a possible illustration of what might be meant and why it's important. And it's often important to the university or the college which might feel otherwise neglected. Uh, you might think that in a, in a place where one institution has a main building on a banknote and one is virtual, uh, that the Open University really values the recognition that comes from being a part of this. And whether or not you consider Queen's and the University of Ulster to be bigger than the Open University, or if our student body is bigger than your student body, uh, we have about 200,000 students uh, and about 7,000 more students at any one time, but they're dispersed, then it doesn't matter. It's not saying it depends how long you've been in existence or how many people you've got, but you have a chance to participate in these seminars. And that's important also because in some worlds there is what we call an economy of esteem, or at least um, there's a book which calls it Economy of Esteem, written by an economist and a, and a philosopher. Uh, and the economy of esteem takes the idea that there is a value to being esteemed, to being respected, to being highly regarded, and a negative value to being treated with contempt or regarded with contempt. And it can be the attitude without any action, which according to those who've written about the economy of esteem, makes a difference to people. And that can be true of us as individuals. We talk about individuals with low self-esteem, sometimes perhaps who've got a high opinion of themselves. Um, but wherever we are on that spectrum, we can be affected by how other people relate to us, how they perceive us, or at least how we perceive how they perceive us. Now, in many walks of life, to be of long standing uh, is a good thing. Uh, and in higher education, it's certainly regarded in that way by many people. So Cambridge and Oxford, 800 years, a good thing. But in other walks of life, for instance, uh, the digital economy, uh, being 800 years old probably isn't a great help. And so, uh, in architecture, you might argue about whether it's old or new that has the ascendancy. But it's different in different contexts. And in the particular context of higher education, the idea that University of Ulster, Leeds Metropolitan University, might be called modern universities, wasn't necessarily seen as a good thing. And when more and more institutions like Liverpool Hope and Strand Millis and St Mary's got university in their title, some of those who had the title a long time ago wanted to call themselves something else, for instance, the Russell Group. So in other words, there's a drawing up of boundaries to say we ought to be more esteemed than you ought to be, or at least that's how it seems to those who feel that they're outside the magic circle. So there is a lot of literature about esteem. The, the economists have included there a book on equality by Keith Joseph, Margaret Thatcher's guru, and Jonathan Sumption, who at the time was a history don, 
but is now uh, a Supreme Court justice. Uh, they weren't big on equality, by the way. Uh, they called the book that. Uh, there's a lot in it on cake. They really don't like the idea that political philosophy is all about slices of the cake and that everybody should have parity and the same slice of the cake. Their line is, whose cake is it anyway? And if we make a bigger cake with our ingredients, we should be able to keep it. But anyway, uh, there's a book called this theme that I have here uh, and that I was contributed to uh, from 1994. Uh, this is in honor of Eric Gallagher. Uh, and, uh, who himself has, has written and sp spoken about esteem and lived it out. And I wrote there about parative esteem in Northern Ireland. And there are two books I particularly wanted to draw to attention from the 1950s, uh, Facial Justice and the Rise of the Meritocracy. These are political satires. L.P. Hartley is well known, if he's known at all, for the opening line of a different novel, The Go-Between, uh, about the past being... Uh, a strange or foreign country uh, where they do things differently. But uh, he also wrote a book called Facial Justice, uh, and uh, you could interpret it as a parody on uh, the education system or on the welfare state or possibly on the demand for racial justice in different parts of the world. Just have to add a little squiggle to turn the facial into racial. Uh, but one way or another, he wasn't keen on the idea that uh, if, if you were to have complete equality, uh, you would, he felt, have an awful kind of totalitarian society. And then Michael Young, uh, Neil Graffin here at the Open University Law School, myself, uh, our home building is called the Michael Young Building. He's one of the founders of the Open University, together with Jenny Lee and Harold Wilson, uh, Labour politicians, and in his case, thinkers, uh, Lord Young, as he later became. And he wrote a book, uh, also in the 19, late 1950s, The Rise of the Meritocracy, in which he attacked the notion of merit. Like many political satirists, he ended up with the joke being on him, because he's now used as a positive term, a meritocratic society, or to decide things on merit. But he meant it as a criticism. His argument was, again, against uh, education, dividing people at 11, he felt that merit had become a, a false way in which the ruling class divided people. And merit was interpreted, he says in the book, it's a satire, it's, a, it's set in the future. Um, it's set in 2034, by the way. Uh, but he says that merit, IQ plus effort equals merit, is a distortion because what we think of as IQ or talent or intelligence is conditioned by privilege. And the success of merit, and the thing he didn't like about it, was that people had given up arguing against it. Whereas when it was based on class privilege or uh, land owning or inherited wealth, people could see that there was something wrong in that. So anyway, with all these things going on, there is a lot of literature around which talks about uh, how we need to consider our attitudes to one another. And in Northern Ireland in the early 90s, uh, when the political talks, when in, in those days it was the talks about talks, were stalling, uh, Robin Wilson and I set up with uh, a lot of help from a lot of people, something called Initiative 92, uh, which set up the Uppsala Commission. Uh, we made our own submissions to it, but hundreds of people did. Uh, and thousands of people contributed, considering that there were groups, and they had hearings all, all over Northern Ireland and beyond. Uh, and uh, they didn't call me to a hearing. They basically ignored my own submission, which was called Lost for Words. Um, and uh, they recommended instead a number of things, including parity of esteem. So it's not that I recommended it. Uh, I didn't think it was necessarily uh, a good idea. But it was picked up, particularly by Patrick Mayhew, then the Secretary of State, um, as this process was going on in a Coleraine speech in, in the House of uh, Commons. Uh, and uh, he said that the Uppsala Commission itself had been a very valuable exercise because it liberated people. Uh, we heard their voices. They got to hear what other people were thinking and so on. So parity of esteem was suggested by them and picked up and used ultimately in uh, the Good Friday Agreement. Now, uh, 
what it means is a matter of big debate. Some people say it's meaningless, it's so broad, and it was deliberately broad to be ambiguous, to, to mean anything you wanted. But other people say, no, I don't like it because it does have meaning, and I don't like that meaning. And some people think it does have meaning, and they do like it. So those are the different positions you can adopt. Is it meaningless or meaningful? Uh, and, and why is it a good idea? I think we have to accept for these purposes, at least in a 20-minute presentation, that now Northern Ireland has an enormous number of detailed provisions, some in law, some in guidance, on equality. And so if it's to have any contribution, it must be at a higher level of abstraction. And is there any role for it? Or have people here exhausted all, all the possible issues? I think that there is a space for it. How do you get to it? When I wrote about it, again, it wasn't because I suggested it, but trying to understand it, uh, I gave two examples of how you could reason towards it, one based on the philosophy of John Rawls. In other words, imagine yourselves coming together to agree a, a constitution, but not knowing who you are. So there's a kind of veil of ignorance. Uh, and if you decide in the best interest of everybody, but without knowing exactly who you're going to end up being, which has some similarities, by the way, with the facial justice, rise of the meritocracy, political satires, then you might come to say, well, I would like there to be parity of esteem for whatever kind of group in society I end up in. And the second example I, I gave was the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Uh, the idea that the laborers in the vineyard didn't get paid equally or according to how much they'd worked or merit. But the ones who came late got paid uh, as much as those who came early. Now, you could say that was wrong, or you could say that was inspirational. Uh, you could say it was unfair to the earlier ones. The earlier ones probably did say it was unfair. Uh, but in this parable, it's interesting, isn't it, that it isn't about merit in that sense, or what you've earned, but what is freely given. And it could be described as parity of esteem, and you could apply it if you wanted to, to those who came late to a country or a place, or those who came late to a peace process, or any context, really. And you might say, actually, there's some inspirational genius in that, that the only way you can move forward in some of these contexts is if you do give parity of esteem, as the vineyard owner does in the parable of the vineyard, regardless of, to use Michael Young's term, merit. So, uh, the notion of parity of esteem, therefore, was bubbling up in Northern Ireland in the 1990s, uh, and then it seems to have waned. Uh, I, I've noticed coming back uh, that it's in uh, the newspapers this week in relation to lilies, uh, and it will bubble up from time to time, but it seems as if it's gone away. So where has it ended up? I can report it's alive and well and living in the East Midlands, and indeed in other regions in the National Health Service, as, as Michael indicated. And this fascinates me because another thing I did in Northern Ireland was I was on the South and East Belfast Health and Social Services Trust, which was rooted in mental health. One of the first things we were asked to do as a board was to rename what was then called Purdysburn. And, and I suggested the name, not Bracken Healthcare Park, uh, because it seemed to me that, com coming from campuses, that where there's a, a wall and a long piece of grass to protect maybe the public from uh, the inmates of an institution 100 years ago. Now, if you reconceptualize it and think of it, it's like a park, uh, a campus, but for health. Anyway, you could say, and, and certainly the patients and, and family members and staff said that they were stigmatized because Purdy's burn had become a term of abuse. That's not to say you can get rid of it by just saying, well, we're going to call it this. But anyway, in that mental health context, these things matter. And if you read, as I do, because of my interest in medical law and ethics, uh, these kinds of reports, or if you're still involved in the NHS and you go on endless away days, uh, you get the light shone on parity of esteem. And it really is considered to be a valuable concept. And the context is that uh, mental health provision seemed to be the Cinderella, of uh, the National Health Service, and by using this phrase, parity of esteem, uh, 
those involved in it have been able, politically and practically, to make a difference. There is now much more concern, are we doing enough for mental health provision? Uh, and I, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that almost everybody who talks about it as a politician at Westminster says that parity of esteem is enshrined in the Health and Social Care Act 2012. So I'll just read one exchange. Ed, Ed Miliband asked David Cameron, remember them? Um, whether parity of esteem was being met in the health service. Uh, and he said, in terms, David Cameron said, this is in 2014, in terms of whether mental health should have parity of esteem with other forms of health care, yes, it should. We have legislated to make that the case. Now, all of these things say it's enshrined that 2012 Act, but it's actually not physically there. The, the words aren't there in the text. So it's interesting that as to, it seems to be almost most effective when it's not explicitly mentioned. What the Act actually says is, the, the Secretary of State must continue the promotion, this is in England, of a, but it's applied elsewhere, of a comprehensive health service designed to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of the people of England. And another thing about David Cameron being proud of it being in the Act which it's not in is that his party, the government, objected it to, to that phrase being inserted anyway. So it was opposition amendments which put in physical and mental health. But anyway, let's not argue about uh, whose parity of esteem is it anyway. What's happened is it's brought energy and impetus to mental health services. And, and I want to argue, and perhaps in discussion we can pursue this, that just putting it in a document and forgetting about it is completely different to whether or not it's in the document to say, what are we doing about it? And one of the things which they've done, to come back to the, the, uh, the preference for policy-based, evidence-based policymaking, is that they've constantly shown in figures how mental health has not been treated equitably. And that has been a very powerful uh, method. It's also explicitly in um, other places. For instance, in the South African Constitution. Here on languages, at the bottom there, but you get the general sense of this. If you read, which you might well be doing today, at the Constitution of Zimbabwe, uh, it's not explicitly in the Constitution of Zimbabwe as a phrase, parity of esteem, but rather like the health service, people think it is, and they say the languages have to be treated with parity of esteem. Uh, but the actual phraseology is about treating them equitably. But parity of esteem is in there, and there are at least three examples of that that, again, if you had more time, you might be interested in pursuing. One is that an Afrikaans-speaking lawyer took a case right the way up to uh, the highest court in South Africa, saying that Afrikaans should be one of the languages used by uh, state and national authorities in uh, promulgating legislation. And uh, the court disagreed with him because it says that they have to use at least two. But the court's view is uh, if you've got a lot of languages and you must use at least two, it, parative esteem must mean something and it can't mean treating them all the same. Otherwise, it would have said you must use all of them. The second case in South Africa involved the University of the Free State deciding that it would only teach in English for the majority of its programs instead of all of these languages at the top. And in particular, it wouldn't teach in Afrikaans anymore except, one, where the students were already on a course, or two, where there was a professional need, such as medicine, uh, where you're going to be treating people who are only Afrikaans speaking. Uh, that was challenged, but again, uh, what the university had done was upheld. And then in the last uh, few months, the Chief Justice uh, of South Africa has been criticized, but so far not overturned on this, 
in saying that the court's official record, the language of official record, will be English only. And people say, well, how can you say that when the government has to produce things in two official languages? And he said, well, it's a matter of efficiency. The, Supreme Court, the Constitutional Court, in the case of South Africa, its judges don't all speak all of these languages. But there's a, a vibrant argument about these things. So it's not true to say that parity of esteem is just a phrase used in Northern Ireland uh, and uh, forgotten here. It is used both because it's explicitly in certain constitutions or legal provisions or because it's taken to sum them up elsewhere. Now, coming back to the starting point of, of education, uh, the 1943 Norwood report led to legislation in the 1940s on both sides of the Irish Sea, often described as setting up grammar schools, but it's setting up really a tripartite system of secondary, technical, and grammar schools. Uh, and I never quite understood until I saw it in the report why the phrase was secondary modern, um, but is actually there with a small s and a capital M. Um, but even though they said there should be parity of esteem, uh, they had this uh, word of warning that, in a sense, uh, you have to earn it. And that, I think, presents another challenge. Do we agree with that? Uh, is it the case that we, if we are discriminated against in some way, or treated badly, or, or haven't been acknowledged, have to show our worth? Or is imperative esteem designed to get over that? So, if we look at what's happening elsewhere in the world, the German High Court last week decided the case on gender, which implicitly can be explained by parity of esteem. You may have seen this in the press. The court said you can't have a system in which you, you either put in male or female in your official record. Uh, you could have a system, they're leaving it to the government to design exactly what to do. You could just not require gender. Why do you have to put it in at all? Whether it's a birth certificate or anything else. But if you do put male and female, then you've got to have some other way of allowing people to record gender fluidity, if you like, or their interpretation of their gender. And if you read this phrase, uh, this, this passage I'm going to read from the German High Court last week, I'll translate it as I go. Um, you can imagine, might this come into play in Northern Ireland or some other country in the future in relation to political aspiration? In other words, is it only for the two, in quotes, main communities? The German High Court says, the assignment of gender is of paramount importance for individual identity. It usually plays a key role both for a person's self-conception and for the way this person is perceived by others. Current civil law interferes with this right. It requires a gender entry, but does not allow the complainant, who permanently identifies as neither male nor female, an entry corresponding to the gender identity. Even if this person chose the option no entry, it would not reflect that the complainant does not see themselves as a genderless person, but rather as having a gender beyond male or female. Now, whether in the assembly or otherwise, it's an interesting question as to does the word other do enough for these purposes? if you don't want to designate yourself as unionist or nationalist, as a party or as an individual, or in debate. And then obviously there's a question as to, well, we're not in Germany, but in Northern Ireland, was the uh, Good Friday Agreement and the use of parity of esteem solely meant to be for the two main communities, or can it now be applied to those who see their political aspiration identity as fluid or to those who see gender or sexuality in, in fluid ways. So, uh, these books, uh, I think, are a useful way of thinking about parity of esteem. Uh, the Facial Justice book talks about uh, the horrors of a dictatorship. This is imagining a nuclear uh, cataclysm and in life afterwards, a benevolent, uh, well, a dictator who considers themselves to be benevolent uh, is being criticised uh, and begins to sound like the um, 
Westminster government being criticised in Northern Ireland. And eventually says, well, I kind of give up. Um, get on with it then. Um, patience and delinquence is how the dictator addresses people. Um, I have been criticised and the, the dictator says, uh, I've been called all sorts of things. My intelligence service tells me 271 bad names for me are now in common usage. Uh, my pride was hurt and I even took measures of repression but then decided you should have your liberty. You picture me as a remote official, hard-headed and hard-hearted, with only one thought behind all I do, how to cling to power. Uh, that, you say, is the way dictators have always acted. They cling to power until another power is strong enough to unseat them. I mean, you can either be thinking of Westminster or Zimbabwe or whatever, when you consider this passage. It's written in 1959. If you only knew how untrue that is of me, I would like to resign, abdicate, vanish. Uh, and I'm not bluffing, but for your sakes I stay on. Now, in that kind of a world, is a way forward to find parative esteem? And if so, can we analogize here, seeing eventually Strandmiller, St. Mary's, the Irish School of Ecumenics, alongside these three universities in the Northern Ireland Assembly? The reason why it's contentious, I think, is, first of all, there are people who think that parity of esteem uh, is just uh, a meaningless concept. Secondly, they might have thought it was meaningful at some point, but it's now been overtaken by lots of detailed rules. Or thirdly, and I think this is a real serious issue, there's confusion. Is it parity of esteem, something to be shown only by the two governments or also by the two traditions or the representatives of those two traditions when there is a political opportunity uh, to display that or by all of us. And then, fourthly, there's a tension about uh, to whom should the esteem uh, be given? Might it include uh, LGBT rights, might it include those who don't see themselves as, as simply unionist or, or, or nationalist. And I think from all of this, to conclude, uh, we might consider what are the conditions in which parity of esteem thrives or flourishes. First, it seems as if, if you look at the energy in the NHS or the energy there was in the 1990s in the Upsar process and, and the Good Friday Agreement, it seems to be that it works best in constitution building, as in the languages issues in South Africa or, or, or in those other examples. In other words, when there is dialogue, or to put it another way, it's about the process itself. There is something valuable in hearing what other people really think rather than imagining what they think. And when you find yourself expressing things that other people say don't show esteem, that's a learning process. And, and the second point is that it's not enough to use it, uh, to weaponize it, as politicians might say, when we think someone else is not living up to it. If we're not reflecting on how we live out the idea by taking action ourselves. So that warning in the Norwood report that it can only be won, parity of esteem can only be won by the school itself, I guess, applies to us. Is there some way in which we could look at all the issues, whether it's uh, lilies and poppies, languages, whatever it might be, uh, and say it isn't just the outcome, but it's the process, uh, the attitudes that we display in that process that makes a difference. And if we make a difference, well then, the political actors and ultimately uh, the governments be able genuinely to show us parity of esteem. Thank you.